Attention listeners, on September 1st this year, SubChina will be changing our name to The China Project. SubChina started six years ago as a daily newsletter. In the time since, we've grown into a full-fledged news and information services platform. In addition to the Seneca Podcast Network, we now have six newsletters, daily editorial features, great video series, webinars, conferences, business intelligence databases, and business services. Our name is changing to reflect the quality of the work that we do and the seriousness of our mission. We exist to help the world understand China better. We are The China Project. Follow along at www.thechinaproject.com and join us as we continue to bring more light and less heat to reporting on China and to cover this complex and vitally important country with neither fear nor favor. Now on with the show. Football fans, the first Sunday of the NFL season is here. And DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL, is giving new customers a can't-miss offer to celebrate the return of the NFL season. Right now, new customers can bet just $5 and get $200 in free bets instantly. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use promo code WONDERYVA to get $200 in free bets instantly when you place a $5 bet this Sunday. That's code WONDERYVA, only at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. Must be 21 or older, Virginia only. Bonus issued as free bets. One early win token issued at opt-in. Money line bets only. Deposit and wagering restrictions apply. Eligibility and terms at DraftKings.com slash football terms. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem, call the Virginia Problem Gambling Helpline at 888-532-3500. <laughs> This is the You Can Learn Chinese podcast, part of the Seneca Network from SubChina. For everyone who's trying to learn Chinese or reaching for the next level, you came to the right place. I'm your host, Jared Turner, longtime resident of China, co-founder of the Mandarin Companion Graded Reader Series. And when people say, I'm only human, are they expecting to be like, oh, my bad, I had no idea. My co-host is John Passon, co-founder of Manor Companion, founder of All Set Learning, the Chinese Grammar Wiki, Sinosplice.com, and told me if he got a dollar for every time he thought about me, he would start thinking about me. Let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Jared Turner coming at you from Utah in the United States. Hi everybody, I'm John Passon. I'm in Shanghai, China. How's it going? All right, John, we have quite the episode in front of us here. We have a special guest interview, but it's more than just a normal interview, right? Yeah, so today is a big, long discussion with the guest over the entire course of the podcast, right? Without further ado, I am going to introduce our guest. His name is Fred Poole. He is an academic at Michigan State University, and in the last 15 years, he's been teaching languages in, in four different countries. He speaks Chinese, Spanish, and English. Uh, he's ter- teaching a lot of graduate level courses on the use of like games and education and mobile app development for learning. Uh, and he's doing some really cool, interesting stuff on game based learning. We're really excited to have him here with us today. Fred, thanks for joining us. Happy to be here. Really excited to be chatting with you guys. All right, Fred, before we kick in, I am going to ask you the big question of why did you start learning Chinese? Yeah, so um, I get asked this question quite a bit. I think with a lot of people who are who end up learning Chinese, um, but honestly, it was largely because I didn't know a whole lot about China at the time. I had just finished an undergrad um, studying Spanish literature, and I was um, finishing a year abroad in Spain, and I was kind of looking at what to do next. I really enjoyed my time being abroad, and um, China had always been this. Um, sort of unknown place for me. At the time, you know, the romantic in me was like, yeah, I'm going to go to China. I'm going to learn the culture. I'm going to learn the language. It should be one year there, and then I'm going to go out <laughs> to the next country, right? And But then I got there and, um, you know, kind of found that it was going to be longer than one year and <laughs> uh, fell in love with the country, fell in love with the culture, and ended up staying for a lot longer than I intended. It ended up being about seven or eight years. But, you know, honestly, the original motivation was I was in love with traveling. Um, I was in love with learning more languages. And China was this great unknown to me. And so that was the big um, inspiration, so to speak. And before you went, I mean, did you take time to really learn the language? Or did you just, when you're on the ground there, did you just try to get immersed? I mean, what were you doing to actually learn the language along the way? 
Yeah. So literally, I, I knew nothing before I went. Um, I was in Spain teaching English at a dual language immersion program at the time. And I had applied to this job, got a phone call from a guy in China, and he was like, can you be out here in two weeks? Mm. So I actually got my visa um, at a um, at an embassy in, in uh, Barcelona <laughs> and jumped on a plane. I had to go back home for like three days to see my parents and then jumped on another plane back to China. And it was on the plane, but I had picked up this book and I was like learning, you know, you know, those like early Chinese books where like, they're trying to show you like each character and how it looks like, like the pictographs and mm -hmm. you know, how Chinese is easy because they all look like pictures. Um, and so I was kind of looking at each of these characters and that was really the only foundation that I had coming into the country, but I was, uh, pretty obsessed about it. I spent, you know, my first couple of weeks, uh, making flashcards and labeling everything in my apartment and, you know, I was using these Pemsler audio guides, but luckily after about a month being there, I got enrolled in a local university and was uh, doing this intensive Chinese program. And that really kind of got the ball rolling for me. Well, that's great. So, yeah. Well, uh, and what kind of happened from that point to now, wow, you became a professor <laughs> and you're <laughs> focusing on like, you know, game-based learning for second language acquisition. You know, after being in China for as long as I was, um, I, I was teaching English that for a good portion of that time. And I was at the same time learning Chinese and I really enjoyed my job teaching. And so after being in China for about six years, I decided it was time for a change. And I was again at a crossroads thinking, you know, what do I want to do with my life? Where am I going to go? And, you know, after some soul searching, I was, you know, kind of reflecting and thinking, you know, I'm pretty good at this teaching thing. And so that kind of led to a master's in uh, second language teaching at Utah State. And so I went and did that and I had an opportunity to teach Chinese for a bit there as a graduate assistant. And then after I finished the master's program, I was looking into what I wanted to do more. Um, and again, uh, kind of a PhD popped up. I had met some friends, one of the professors in the program suggested it to me, but it was kind of lucky that my... Um, my wife, uh, she actually just found a job right when I finished my master's in Utah. And so while I was looking to go to some of these other PhD programs in foreign language acquisition and teaching, um, she wanted to stay. Mm. And so my options of where I, sh where I needed to go were somewhat limited. And so I tr was looking at Utah State and looking and seeing what kind of programs they had. And the one that looked like the closest fit was instructional technology and learning sciences. They don't really do anything with languages. They tend to focus on science things and can, mm -hmm. computer science and math education. Uh, but I noticed that one of the professors there, that her specialty was games and learning. And I was like, you know, I love games. I've <laughs> been playing games for most of my most of my life. And I have I've actually written a game and activity book for um, language teaching. <laughs> like this is something that I've always been thinking about that'd be great to to be focusing on. I just didn't know it was an option. And when I saw that one of the professors in this program, that this is literally what she has made a career on doing, I was like, this is what I'm going to do. Okay, Fred, I think probably a great place to start this discussion here is to talk a little bit about some of the, the common conceptions about like learning through games, right? So maybe you could first talk, tell us a little bit about like, there's a term that a lot of people will use and may be familiar with is gamification, Right. Mm. Uh, we have a lot of apps and I'm sure a lot of listeners I've used apps, you know, use this concept of gamification. But that's different than game, game based learning. Right. And maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So uh, a lot of people who work in game based learning or game based language learning, um, <clears throat> this is something that they have to kind of wrestle with quite a bit is distinguishing the, between these terms. Because a lot of times when I tell people that I do uh, work with games and language learning, the first thing I get is, oh, like Duolingo, right? <laughs> and I have to kind of slow that conversation down and go, uh, not quite, right? So for us, gamification and how gamification is typically defined is it's the act of taking game elements and applying them to non-game scenarios. And so by definition, uh, gamification is not game-based learning because it's, it's purely taking something that we uh, normally wouldn't associate with gaming and taking um, some features of games such as points, narratives, 
and applying them to non-gaming environments. An example of this might be you're in a classroom and you want your students to be working on uh, memorizing different vocabulary words. And so to encourage your students to um, memorize these vocabulary words, you might you know, break st students up into like four different groups, assign them a team name, and then start applying points to whoever remembers the most vocabulary words. And then you're going to track those over time. This would be an example of gamification. So we're taking this activity, which would be um, memorizing or repeating vocabulary words, we're applying points to it, and we're making a competition out of it. In contrast to games, Defining games can always be a little bit arbitrary as well, because uh, what a game is to everyone is going to be somewhat different, right? Uh, for some people, a game could be make-believe in their living room, and for other people, a game is something very specific like Mario. You know, scholars have had a number of ways that they define it, but typically it includes having a goal, having some form of randomness within the game, and then having a set of rules that constrain um, the type of of ways that you can act in which to attain that, that goal. Um, there's also this idea that it entails fun, that we do it not because we have to, but because we um, legitimately enjoy it. And this is another um, contrast with gamification in that typically with gamification is that it's someone else who is applying the system to us to get us to do something that we may not necessarily want to do. It's a lot like chocolate covered broccoli, right? <laughs> um, we're trying to get you to do something we don't want you to do. And so we're going to cover it up with some of these superficial mechanics and make it feel like a game when it actually isn't. And so there's also quite a bit of literature that talks about the, the really the nefarious nature of gamification and how we're really tricking our students um, to doing something that we maybe shouldn't be doing in the first place. So, so something like uh, you know, Quizlet comes to mind. Mm. Uh, anyway, you know, that's a it's a for anyone who's not familiar with it, that's a platform and teachers can use, and they can you know, it's pre-existing games, right? You can put words or characters or whatever into those things, and a variety of games. So that would I'm assess I'm kind of gathering maybe that's a bit more of like a gamification concept. Yes, one one hundred percent, one hundred percent. And some of the problems that we we see with gamification is that they tend to rely heavily on these external motivations and these external rewards um, to motivate students to to do this activity. And what happens is that over time, students become more fixated and more interested in these external factors rather than the act of what they're doing. Mm. Whereas in in game based learning, typically we have this goal or this objective that we you know usually within the game that we want to complete the game. And we are intrinsically invested in the game and we're using our language as a means to complete those objectives and, and those goals. And so it, our language use becomes meaningful and not just a, a means to collect points. Um, if that, you can start to see the difference there a little so, bit. So I'll throw out an argument on this. So it's say, okay, Quizlet game. Uh, I have to pop the balloons that have character, like uh, color characters on them, right? And mm -hmm. and as they come through, oh, that one's, you know, hey, hey, so, okay, I'm going to pop that one. Yay, I win a point, right? I'm mm -hmm. using my language, you know, to complete the game and yay, I, I, I'm, but how is that different than, than really that intrinsically based motivation that happens in game-based learning? Yeah, so when you say that you're using your language skills within this uh, within this Quizlet app, what exactly are you accomplishing? I'm popping balloons. That's really important, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, you're popping balloons. You're, you're you're getting ten points on this, but you're just confirming that you know a word. Is it okay to look at it this way? So it's kind of like the starting point. If the starting point is a game that you would play anyway, then you could add in some language learning elements to 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 make learning out of it. Whereas if it's a vocabulary activity and you're adding in game stuff, that's gamified. So the, the balloon game, would you play it by itself just to pop balloons? Eh, maybe not, right? It's not much of a game. Is that a way to look at it, Fred? Yeah, I mean, I, you could look at it like that. I mean, I, I think that that intrinsic interest at the beginning of would you do this, whether or not the Chinese was involved with it is a good. But I, I think part of the problem is like, like Candy Crush, right? People love Candy Crush. And what are you, you're essentially popping balloons there. I mean, you're, you're mm -hmm. looking for patterns <laughs> and you get like this, this kind of a rush of, of finding those patterns. But I think one, one of the differences here is that other than the simple fact that within Quizit, you're just looking at these at one word at a time, you never really ever have to use your language for any form of communication or to complete any sort of real world task. You are simply popping a button. I mean, it, it, it's a flashcard system. And flashcard systems are great, and they have their role. Um, but when we talk about gamification, we're just talking about a hyped up flashcard system, which again, has its role should be used meaningfully or uh, um, minimally. But within a game based language system, you have the opportunity that, you know, understanding the dialogue could mean the difference in saving you 20 hours in the game. 
um, depending on how you respond to a character in, in a well-designed game, could make the difference in what happens next in game, whether you get an item or not. Like, there's real-world consequences for the, how language is used within these games, right? And, and a lot of times what we're looking at with game-based language learning is not just the language that's happening within the game, but a lot of times the language that happens around the game. Mm. There's quite a bit of literature that talks about we develop these communities around games because we want to share the experiences that we have within these games. And so once I go into a game, um, if I'm playing it with a Chinese guild or if I'm ch- playing it with um, some buddies of mine in China, when I come out of it, I'm going to want to discuss what happened in it. I want to share those experiences with other people. And I'm doing it because I'm so invested in the game and what happened in it because it's unique to me now what's happening in quizlet is not unique to me it's going to be pretty much the same for everybody oh uh, what'd you do today i popped 10 balloons how about you <laughs> yep i got 10 too right <laughs> i mean we might differ a little bit in our in our the percentages and our accuracy but that experience isn't something that's going to want to be shared you know, as you're talking about this, uh, it kind of comes to mind uh, something I read. I was reading some of your papers, Fred, in preparation mm. for today. You know, you you refer to some of those, some of these things like Quizlet and uh, uh, perhaps even Duolingo as kind of the drill and kill uh, type yeah. method, right? It's just like you're drilling this stuff over and over. And to me, it almost sounds a little bit like the difference between having a closed-ended and an open-ended question, right? You know, you know is, uh, you know, are you happy? Yes or no, right? That you don't get a whole lot of out of, out of that. But, you know, how are you feeling today? You know, that's a little more open-ended, right? Yeah, for sure. And, and you know, I, I think for me, a lot of this comes back to, like, the whole debate over uh, explicit knowledge and implicit knowledge and explicit instruction and implicit instruction. There's this, there's this common conception that, um, you know, if I go into an app and and I do this trill, this kill and drill type of exercise, and I'm developing this explicit knowledge about vocabulary words where I can I can see the Chinese word as you're saying hesa the or hesa black, uh, lusa green right, and I can sit there and I can translate each of these words here, and if I develop enough vocabulary words. I'm going to be able to take this explicit knowledge, this uh, concrete knowledge about these vocabulary words, and I'm going to be able to apply it in context when I need it spontaneously. This is the assumption that is typically happening with these types of apps. One of the problems that we run into, though, is that we know that language, when we're using it spontaneously, is that it is a, a series of constructions, right? It's a series, like, it's not just these vocabulary words devoid of context. They tend to appear with certain verb forms. They tend to appear in certain phrases. They tend to appear in certain contexts. And the only way that we can learn these is if we see these these words in context and we become exposed to them in context when they're being used meaningfully. Because if they're not being used meaningfully, if they're not being used to serve a purpose, um, then they start to lose um, some of their value. That's one of the the differences that we're seeing here within a game-based learning context is that we have these worlds, these environments that are um, highly contextualized, h- highly meaningful, and uh, language is being used uh, to accomplish something, right? And so we're able to start making some of these connections. And that's where you start to develop some of this implicit knowledge. When you're seeing mm-hmm. how these words are using in context and how they're being collocated with other um, vocabulary, with other forms, you start to des- develop these implicit understanding of when and how I use this language. And uh, that's right along the lines with uh, you know a lot of what John and I usually t- will talk about you know with extensive reading. It's uh, a lot of implicit learning happens there. Mm-hmm. Oh, for sure, for sure, for sure. But the difference then between like reading and game based learning is that um, within a game, your text is reacting to you, right? And each one of us are going to again have a unique experience. You know, with within a a text or within a reading, when we come out of it, you know, we can talk about how that reading made us feel, but we're reading the same thing. The text isn't changing, but our games are. Okay, so Fred, for our listeners, I just want to clarify something. You're focused mainly on game-based learning in person, or are you more focused on games or a certain kind of game, like board games or card games? Like, What's the focus of your, your instruction and your own research mainly? I would say, if I had to summarize it in one sentence, it would be how teachers leverage games for language teaching. And you, you mean in the physical classroom then? Yes, yes, in the physical classroom. Because we do have quite a bit of research that shows how students can learn um, via games naturally in the wild. There's some great studies out there that illustrate um, how games create these communities of practice. And within these communities, um, other players can support a language learner in their language skills um, naturally through the game. And that's great. That's wonderful. But a lot of the research that we have been kind of pushing or that I've been working with recently is 
illustrating how when we bring a game into the classroom, um, the teacher can leverage that game in unique ways to design lessons around the game, to utilize those experiences, to develop activities where we can have these rich interactions between students in the classroom. Like I look at it as like a highly interactive textbook. Well, let's talk about one of those. And in fact, uh, one of the papers you wrote was around a game that you developed is called Shen Mi Sending, right, which is a mystery mm-hmm. forest. Maybe, maybe you could tell us about uh, that game that you developed and, and about some of the research you did using that game. Um, with Mystery Forest, this is one of the first games that I was working with, and this is a board game that I developed for the Utah Dual Language Immersion Program. And for those who are not familiar with the Dual Language Immersion Program, um, students in these programs typically uh, spend half their day in the target language, which for this particular study was in Chinese, and the other half is in the um, the L1 or the majority language, which was English for this setting. And so they would learn, um, they would have about 30 or 40 minutes a day specifically devoted to Chinese, but most of their day would be spent learning math and then science in, in the target language. One of the, the, the struggles for many of the teachers in, in dual language immersion programs is finding ways of integrating both content instruction and language instruction into one activity. Language teachers can be very good at teaching a language, and they can be very good at teaching math, but finding ways to teach math while also um, supporting language skills can be somewhat of a challenge. Hmm. And for me, this is where I saw um, developing a board game as a nice uh, solution to this. Um, because within a board game, there's quite a bit of research that shows that, that we actually develop a lot of intuitive math skills by simply rolling a dice. I do uh, Dungeons and Dragons with my kids, and they, they learn math pretty fast that way. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And especially for like the second graders, which is the group I was working with in this, I was working with in this study, um, a majority of their math at this level is doing uh, simple addition, simple subtraction, and then even getting into like double digit addition and subtraction. And that's pretty much where, where, where most of the um, <clears throat> mathematics is happening within the board game. And so I wanted a I wanted to develop a board game that would both develop math skills and these language skills. And specifically with language skills, I wanted to promote these natural opportunities for students to engage with each other. Kind of to set the, set the stage, within the game, students start off at one of four, quarter, four corners of the board game. And then spread around the, the, the game are these baddies. Um, these baddies are just little fictitious characters of like a tree that has come to life, a rock that has oh, come no. to life. Um, ah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I got to say, I loved reading the word baddies in your research paper. I'm like, yes. <laughs> First paper I've read used that word. Right, right. And so with these baddies, the idea is that you roll a dice and then once you come up to the baddie, you're going to engage in a battle um, through, again, rolling dice. But I designed it in a way that the characters themselves or the players themselves will never be able to defeat a baddie on their own. They mm. have to actually uh, collaborate with at least uh, one other person. Now, uh, this was important because this requires them to actually uh, start to strategize on who they want to who they want to collaborate with, who they want to attack, and then when they are attacking, they have to share the information from their dice so that they all can do the uh, subtraction and addition to find out if they were able to defeat the baddie. Once the baddie was defeated, then they get uh, some loot, some rewards, which would come in the form nice. of weapons and armors and um, different accessories that can make their characters a little stronger. And then the end of the game is eventually once they've cleared out all the baddies in the forest, they can move into the center part of the game and they have these uh, final bosses that they can fight. Ah. And that usually requires like six or seven kids playing together. And so it's some pretty simple mechanics. Within my study and after having students play it for an hour, I had on average over 500 utterances in the target language per a group, which is quite a bit of language use. I showed quite a bit, bit of examples of students who were leveraging the board game as a mediator to kind of support their language use. And this is something that I thought was really cool and something that's underused or underthought about with, with board games is that because we have this physical board game and we're in this physical space, when you come to something that you don't know how to say, the students were naturally pointing to different parts of the game, picking up cards, and using this to sort of support their language skills. They were so motivated and so invested in the game that even when they didn't know a word, or they didn't know how to say something, they were finding ways around it. Like yeah. 400 utterances in 40-ish minutes. So that's like about 10 a minute, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Kids have saying a lot of stuff. There's a lot of conversation going on, right? Well, yeah, and even after the game was over, that was probably the coolest part is that as the kids are walking out of the classroom, you could still hear conversations going of like, ah, you see my sword? I got this green sword. <laughs> and another kid's going, yeah, yeah, but I'm really good. And so yeah. like, you know, each of these items that they were getting, each of these items that they were getting, 
you know, and this is something I say quite a bit, they almost forgot that they were in the language classroom. And this is one of the critiques of the language classroom is that people argue that we can never really develop some of these implicit skills or implicit knowledge because we're always acutely aware that we are in the language classroom and we're always acutely aware that we're there for the language learning purpose. But for these 40 minutes, that was somewhat suspended for a bit. So if the kids got so into the game, how many got super frustrated and flipped the board? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> right right um there no <laughs> none, none hopefully none <laughs> no that was that was the thing is that uh the consequences for losing were just starting over <laughs> and so if i had more severe consequences we may have seen that um but i think there was only <laughs> there's only two or three groups that actually failed at um defeating a baddie because one of the things that we pre-taught them with the game is that you have to uh, do these calculations to see if you um, are actually strong enough or if your group is strong enough to take one down. And so there were two or three groups who did fail in this, and they did get pretty frustrated. Uh, <laughs> but no table or no uh, board flipping going on. <laughs> you, you did this and you wrote a paper all about it, but what was, what was the result? One of the, one of the key things that I like thinking about with this is this idea. We talk a lot about in the language classroom about authentic materials, but we don't talk a whole lot about like authentic language use, right? Mm. To be completely honest, I'm not sure how much authentic language use we want in the classroom because it's good. Authentic use is good, but it's it's choppy, it's messy, it's serving a purpose, it's survival, it's just to get by. But if we can manufacture instances in the classroom where we do give students an opportunity to engage in authentic language use, which I think was what was happening within this board game, is that all pretenses of me making a mistake are gone. I am so focused on this goal, on this objective. I'm so focused on these items that I'm collecting that communication is the only thing I'm working on right now. And the reason I'm hesitant to say we want to do that all the time is because we're not working on accuracy. We're not um, pushing ourselves to go beyond our, our, our current language abilities. But, you know, it definitely does have its place and it definitely does um, allow us to put into practice what we have learned on a day to day basis. I think that's fantastic. And uh, in fact, it's so interesting that we're going to take a quick break for a word from our sponsor. Yeah. That's right. And John, today our sponsor is. Mandarin Companion, Chinese graded readers, easy to read novels entirely in Chinese. That's right, and today we are talking about Sherlock Holmes and the case of the curly haired company. John, what's this all about? Curly haired company? Okay, so this is a level one graded reader, that's 300 Chinese characters, and this is based on a Sherlock Holmes story, but that was the Red Headed League. And it was based in England, of course. So we have a story that's entirely adapted to the Chinese context where no one has red hair, but some people have curly hair. Yeah, I've never seen uh, Chinese redheaded people. Fred, have you? (laughs) No, unfortunately, I have not seen that. But but curly haired, we have those. Yes, we do. Well, they do have hair dyeing here now, so I've seen a few, but they're pretty rare. Yes, yeah, it's very rare. It's not natural. Let's put it that way. So you can go out and get it today. It's uh, Sherlock Holmes in the case of the Curly Haired Company. Manor Companion, level one graded reader using only 300 basic characters. You can find it on Amazon, iBooks, Kobo, and probably other places too, right? Print copies as well, yes. All right, so go out and get it today. Next up, we have Rants and Raves. John, what do you have for us today? Do you have a rant or do you have a rave? I have a rant. Actually, I had prepared one, but listening to Fred talk, I was inspired to give another one. Um, th- this is this is from Life in China. So my son just completed first grade at a local all-Chinese elementary school. And first grade is when you officially learn Chinese characters in China. Oh, yeah. You're supposed to be, you're supposed to be learning pinyin before first grade, but in first grade, that's where the characters officially start. Mm-hmm. Of course, most parents will you know, pre-teach a bunch of characters, but officially you start in first grade. But here's the frustrating part. In math class, in first grade, you know, they're learning addition, subtraction, that kind of thing. They insist on giving word problems, which are written entirely in Chinese characters, with characters that the kids cannot yeah. possibly read. It's like, what? Yeah. And they just keep doing this. I've seen, I, I remember that now. They just keep doing this <laughs> year after year. It's like, guys, if you could just wait a year on the word problems, or at least provide pinyin, 
then the kids would have a chance. And, and they just always do this in first grade. It's so frustrating. Got to destroy that confidence early, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Chinese, Chinese school is hardcore. That That's for sure. And, and it's always the same story. Like the kids like, well, I can do the math, but I just can't read the question. And it's like, what are you testing here? <laughs> okay, anyway, that's it. That's my rant. All right, great. Well, Fred, you're participating today in Rants Raise. What do you have for us today? A rant or a rave? My, I mean, it's going to be a rant because we're talking about games. The research that we tend to focus on with Chinese games is almost always going to be on tones or developing characters. Like every game that we see for Chinese language learning is on tones or characters. I feel like because those are the two unique aspects of Chinese, this is something that we all want to gravitate towards, but there are other ways of designing games. There are other things that we can be doing. I really miss, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Zon. It was like a game back in 2008. It was like short-lived. It was up for two years. It had really terrible graphics. <laughs> I mean, really terrible. Oh, I remember that game. Yeah, yeah. And it it definitely had a lot, uh, it had a lot of potential, um, but they let it die. But it was just this open world place. You could walk around, you could talk to vendors, you could talk to people at the airport. There's so much you could have done with this game or games like this, you know, and it was more right. focused on the, the experience rather than let's work on your tones for the next hour. That's my rant. All right, so Jared, you got a rant or a rave? Rave. John, I have got a rave today. That's right. A rave and raving today. So uh, I've, I've been talking to some Chinese teachers recently, and I, I just thought this was really cool, and I got a rave about this. A school down in Texas. In fact, I found out there, there's a number of schools like this where they are doing, like, not dual language immersion, but tri-language immersion. So specifically, this one down in, in, in Texas, they're doing Mandarin and Spanish immersion. They think the program's been going about three or four years now. So far, they're having some pretty good results, which is pretty interesting. And asking about it, it's like half the days in Spanish, half the days in Chinese, and they're not really doing English. So there's no English instruction? No, no, not really. <laughs> is this the like from K through six? Like they don't. They're in third grade at this point, so wow. it's uh, they've gone from K to third grade, and so far the kids are hitting their proficiency standards or something. And I'm a little unclear how the whole the English side's working out, but, but this I, I'm pretty I was pretty impressed by that. So, and I found out I was talking to another teacher today. Like, yeah, there's actually a number of schools like this, uh, some in some other areas, and I had no idea. So, uh, evidently, this is the thing: uh, trilingual immersion. Um, and I guess it makes sense, you know. Some I've seen kids growing up in families where like the dad speaks French and uh, you know mom speaks English and they learn Chinese at school and they've got all three so I, I don't know it's crazy stuff that sounds super interesting I'm gonna have to check it out yeah so uh, everyone now it's time to get bilingual not good enough you gotta get trilingual right <laughs> well Jared some of us in this uh, in this podcast have accomplished that already hey quiet you <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I think there's only one of us, yeah? There's only one of us three doesn't speak Spanish. And I'm Hispanic. Okay. I have a Hispanic background, so hey, I, shame, shame. Right. Get to it. All right, well, Fred, some of the other things I want to uh, talk about here uh, is, is also you've done some uh, research and also like kind of some online games, some computer games, some role-playing games that you've developed. Maybe you could first tell us about uh, I, that game. I, what is it? It's like The Last Dragon. Let me um, let me first provide a, just a very brief history of some of the games that I've, I've designed, and that'll kind of provide some context for how I came up with Legend of the Dragon. So the first game I, I um, developed was uh, Mystery Forest, and that was a board game. But it was quite labor-intensive, um, collecting all that data, transcribing mm -hmm. the students' conversations. And so I was then kind of attracted towards some of these other um, digital environments because one of the benefits of digital environments is that we can automatize this process. In thinking about automatizing this process and collecting data on students while they're engaging in these digital environments was also something that was in line with my, my advisor who does research with uh, game-based assessments, also sometimes called stealth assessments. Hmm. And this really looks at how we can take digital games and we can take some of the log data, which looks at uh, you know the different clicks that students are clicking on, how much time they spend on a text, um, the different parts of the game that they're accessing. And we're using that log data, that behavioral data, to try to, as evidence for learning, 
or proficiency. And so that's something that I was really looking forward to doing with Legend of the Dragon. The Legend of the Dragon was a game I developed within um, RPG Maker MV. Not sure if you're familiar with this. Yep. John's familiar. Ah, good job, John. RPG man. All right, go ahead. <laughs> It, you can get it on Steam. It's you know it usually sells for seventy, but it goes on sale for like twenty bucks. It has a very low entry level threshold for developing games, but it's kind of a very constrained version of the type of games that you can create. So, if this is RPG based, does that mean that the the primary driver to get the students engaged with the game is the story? Like they're doing a lot of reading, and you hope that the game wants them to keep reading. Yes, that's a big driver of it. The narrative starts off by telling um, the students that there's only one dragon left. He's about to die. You need to go off on a quest to help save them. And so, yeah, much of it is dialogue driven. But that's in English or in Chinese? In Chinese. And so this is this game was developed for some a sixth grade class. All of the vocabulary within it was first filtered by looking at what students in the sixth grade class at this Utah school should know before coming into the sixth grade. So we have a list of every vocabulary word that they've been exposed to from first grade up to fifth grade. We, we wrote the story. We, we wrote the narrative. And then we went back and looked at uh, this vocabulary list, then tried to replace some of the unknown words with words that they did know. In cases where we couldn't replace it, we added a glossing system that allowed them to look up the unknown word, but they would only receive the pinyin for it. Oh, it's like, like a pop-up dictionary, right? Yes. And that pop-up dictionary was a key part for, for collecting data so that every time that they clicked on a pop-up word, I would know which word it was. Um, mm-hmm. I could also develop models to see how many times they clicked it up and how many times were repeat words. I could also see which students were never using that pop-up dictionary. One of the troubles, and I'm sure like if you've played games and you, or you've watched people play games, one of the things you know is that um, a lot of times uh, people don't read the dialogue. They just skip it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Click as fast as you can, right? (laughs) Yeah. And so that was something that I was interested in collecting. And that's something that I could track. And that was one of the interesting findings of my research that isn't currently published. It, it, It should be coming out next year. One of one of the papers I published was looking at this data and what it can tell us about students as they're playing this game. And because I had tracked this data, I was able to use what's called a cluster analysis that looks for certain types of groups within the game in terms of how they play the game. And I was able to identify a certain subset that skipped every dialogue, another subset Hmm. that actually read the dialogue, and then a a sort of in-between group that was using the dictionary and the dialogue and was engaging in battles because there is a battle system within it. And so Mm -hmm. this data was able to show um, these three or four really unique groups and how they played the game. And then I was able to take those groups and look at how their learning gains were to see if there was a particular way of playing a game that was more beneficial to learning um, compared to others. But but what did what did you learn about the dialogue skippers? Were they like, you know, not learning as much or what? No, they were. They were. Um, but they were <laughs> their learning was different because because they were skipping the dialogue. They were spending more time in the battle system. And the battle mm. system was very much like Pokemon. Uh, you had to pull a card. And whatever card you pulled, that would summon a baddie to fight another baddie, right? Um, But to be able to do this meant that you were were pulling a lot of cards and you were reading the strengths and weaknesses of these baddies um, to be able to defeat other baddies. And so their learning gains were more focused on um, vocabulary learning games and not so much on reading gains, right? Where Hmm. the students who were reading the dialogues um, experienced more reading gains, which makes intuitive sense. That's interesting. Yeah. The, the key thing here is that, you know, what I was trying to do with this game is to give multiple um, ways of playing it. And so, you know, if you want to just go around and battle other baddies, you could do that. If you wanted to get engaged in, in the story, you could. You could get around battling baddies. If you, kn- if you knew what their favorite food was, you could feed them and that would tame them and they would no longer attack you. Right. But that would require additional reading and understanding um, some of these different texts. So of these four groups you found, I mean, you, you, you identified, you know, maybe the difference between two of these, but did you find that any one behavior led to better learning outcomes than the other? No, <laughs> not necessarily. <laughs> uh, what I did find, uh, what was probably more interesting is I did find a group that just did much worse. <laughs> and that was... Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So th- there was a group of students, there was about nine students who um, just really had a miserable time with this. Really? Why is that? Well, 
a number of reasons. I had to I had to go back and, and look deeper into the data and kind of look at some of our scripts and kind of explore who these students were. And some of it were um, low proficiency. Some of them had mm. computer problems. <laughs> some of them were not interested in games at all. So mm. there were a variety of reasons. But for me, what was cool about this or cool about being able to identify it and coming back to my research interest and looking at how teachers can leverage games is that, you know, imagine if you have a teacher who's in a classroom and, you know, gives their students a game to play. And if they could be getting this data in real time and all of a sudden be alerted that like, oh, you know, group four is struggling. Group four is struggling. We need more attention here. Um, mm. that, that is kind of powerful. It's something that you can, you know, in real time, teachers can um, engage with these students. They can see what's going on. They can mix up the groups and have them sitting with other students to maybe help them get, get them back on track. Oh, that, that's interesting. I, some, some thoughts that come to mind about that uh, is, is simply that, number one, interest. Like, it's really mm-hmm. important to, like, give people opportunity to follow their interests. And just some kids were just not interested in the game at all, right? Some people are just not gamers, <laughs> and then and then also the aspect of like comprehensible input, right? And it sounds like some people, their level was just too low and they just weren't able to really function because it just wasn't high enough to really, I guess, you know, understand really what was going on. You know, and, and part of it, I think... This project involved like three studies, and one study was looking specifically at what the data from within the game could tell us about learning. And the other one, I was really kind of zooming out and looking at the classroom dynamic and looking at how the teacher engages with this with the, the students and then also how the students are engaging with each other. And the other thing is that if a student is struggling in terms of um, their language proficiency, it could be as simple as uh, putting them with a, another group of learners who are more supportive or who are more collaborative. If you have some students who are high proficiency and don't necessarily need that community to continue going through the game, you know, maybe you put them in, a, in another group where that collaboration isn't necessarily happening so much. Okay, so Fred, you mentioned earlier that you wrote a book about games in the classroom for language learning. Is that right? Yeah, very loosely on a book. It's it's basically about a 80-page um, PDF on uh, some of the games and activities that I use quite a bit in the classroom. Oh, can we link to that? Can people download it? Yeah, yeah, it's on my website. We'll put a link in the show notes. Okay, so f- out of those games, I was wondering, for the Chinese classroom, what are some of your favorites? Like, what games should people be looking at if they want to spice up their Chinese learning in the classroom? Of those games, though, those are what I would call, like, classroom games you know they're they take no prep they're free they are things that are fairly intuitive to learn um but probably the one i like the most is my territory grab what's that <laughs> it's it's basically like risk um you take a whiteboard you partition the board off into different sections and then within each of the sections you put a target word or a target form or a topic that you want uh, students to be working on I don't know, if you want to do like sports, right? And so we're working on superlatives of what's your favorite, what's your favorite sport to be working on? It's um, mainly an, an oral activity in which um, students are going to have to complete whatever the task is in that particular territory. Once they do, they claim that territory. Another group will come in and they'll claim a territory as well. And then slowly they're going to claim territories as they move across the board. Once two groups are in adjacent territories, they can do a rock, paper, scissors. Whoever wins claims that territory. Um, the game continues until one group completely takes over another territory and then they morph into their group and then it continues until one group has the entire board is this a game that adults get into as well yeah (laughs) i I can imagine that yeah yeah. i mean uh, adults are just looking for an excuse to get into a game to be honest Uh, in my experiences (laughs) like there aren't many games that adults don't get into so fred what if someone who's you know learning by themselves are there any games out there that you might recommend that it will be a, a great opportunity from the, also to learn or practice the Chinese? First, uh, I think we need to acknowledge that there are several games out there that can be converted in, into Chinese. I, I know a, a lot of friends of mine who will play on WoW servers in Chinese, or they'll play mm-hmm. in other MMORPG um, servers in Chinese, and there's uh, it's pretty easy to get into some of those communities. But if you're looking for just kind of a standalone game, Stardew Valley is actually a, a pretty cool option. You can go on to Reddit. There's a, a, a Reddit forum for Stardew Valley that will help you find collaborators to play with you on um, a particular oh, wow. farm. 
because cool. Stardew Valley currently has an option of having three people playing together um, on this one platform. That's kind of how I got started, actually. I uh, went on to Reddit and said, hey, I'm looking to play Stardew Valley in Chinese. Is anybody up for it? And within a day, I got two people who were interested, and we played for about six months together. And... All three of us had the game in Chinese. We were able to chat with each other. We had uh, most of the vocabulary is, is fairly simple, but it's also somewhat niche, which is kind of what I was looking for, getting out of my mm -hmm. comfort zone um, and being exposed to different language, different vocabulary words. So it's a pretty cool experience. Well, uh, Fred, following up on that, what what game do you wish existed that doesn't now? Like if someone would just take this game and then like do this with it so we could we could do it in Chinese or we could use it to learn Chinese, what, what would be at the top of your wish list? You know, um, I don't know if you guys have seen the uh, seen the trailers for the. I think it's called Identity. Yeah. Have you seen that? I, not recently, but I have. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a game that's being developed at the moment called Identity, and essentially, you like it. It, it, it's a little terrifying because it's essentially recreating our reality, but in a virtual world, right? You you take on this individual person who can go out and get a job. He can rent an apartment. You can choose not to have a job. You can become a criminal. It's essentially placing <laughs> you in this real world setting. If this game could be in Chinese, if we could have full Chinese audio, I mean, that would be uh, pretty awesome, to be honest. One of the issues that you have is a lot of these games do translate into Chinese, but they don't give you the full audio. Or if they do give you the full audio, it's a game that's not terribly interactive with it. But um, with a game like Identity or some of these other very in interactive RPGs, having that option could be a unique way to kind of practice your language skills. I'll have to, I can share it with you later, but there is somebody who was developing sort of a wizard game in which you used Chinese to actually cast your spells, which was hmm. also kind of a, a pretty unique idea. Oh yeah, I saw that. I think I saw that on Reddit. All right, Fr Fred, before we wrap up today, I really uh, want to ask something that might help some of our listeners. Like we mentioned Duolingo and you said it's not game-based, it's really just gamification. Fine, but does that make it bad? Like, do you do you still recommend Duolingo? Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't say it's bad by any means. I mean, there's actually a study that came out literally a year ago that shows 800 participants at a university a Spanish class compared with 150 students just doing Duolingo. And um, after a semester, they had similar learning gains. Now, I, I do want to say that, that there's a grain of salt with that in that 150 participants in the Duolingo study were the 150 that persisted for six months on their own. Mm. And so there's probably about three or 4,000 other people who dropped from that study. <laughs> and so um, I guess what I would say is that if you are highly engaged and highly motivated, Duolingo is a fine option. You know, it's addictive. I play it myself. I love it. The issue that we see is that uh, without a teacher, without a class, without a community, uh, about 80% of us are going to drop it after two weeks and say, oh, it was fun, but I'm done now. Well, you know, that brings up something I, I usually say, Fred, is that, you know, a motivated learner can learn despite poor methods, but an unmotivated learner can avoid learning despite best methods. And yeah, I, I guess like one of the, one of the things that I'd, I'd want to end on here when coming back with game-based learning is just to really emphasize that it's less about which game that we're playing or which game that we're teaching with, but really thinking about the experiences that students are having within the games and how those students can, and how those experiences can be leveraged within our classroom, getting our students to talk about it because I, <laughs> a lot of our students are playing these games and they become invested in it. These games become um, a part of who we are. Um, they allow us to explore different parts of us while we're playing these games. And that experience can be very powerful. And that's something that can be uh, leveraged by teachers um, when designing lessons and activities. So, Well, Fred, I really appreciate that. Uh, words of wisdom. And I appreciate you taking the time to share this perspective with us and like about your research. It's been fascinating to me. Yeah, thanks a lot, Fred. And where can people find more about what you're doing? So on, on my website, fredpool.github.io, um, that's where I have pretty much everything that <laughs> up, up to date. Great. Well, we'll put a link in the show notes. And if anyone you want to find some of his stuff and you have some links to some of those games you've done uh, there as well. So uh, you can you can find some of those resources. Well, thanks again, Fred. We really appreciate taking the time to be with us. Yeah, super excited. Uh, yeah, it was great being here with you guys. And yeah, thanks. You have been listening to the You Can Learn Chinese podcast. Help us spread the word by sharing this with your friends, classmates, teachers, cousins, plumber, pathologist, paralegal, porter, paramedic, police officer, president, personal trainer, that one guy named Pete. You can subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And please write us a review so we know how we're doing. You can find us on Facebook and at mannercompanion.com. Apologies to John Cena, we just ran out of time. 
The You Can Learn Chinese podcast is produced by myself, Jared Turner. And our editor for this episode is also myself, Jared Turner. And I'd like to thank our special guest, Fred Poole. And of course, thanks to my co-host, the man, the myth, the legend, John Paston. See you next time.